konferensi yang uh, kedua tahun lalu kita sudah menyelenggarakan konferensi uh, yang sama dan topiknya itu berkisar di soal-soal bagaimana penggunaan e-learning ya pasca uh, pandemi. Nah tahun ini kita mau fokus kepada hal-hal yang sifatnya berkaitan dengan uh, urgensi uh, situasi di Indonesia. Bagaimana memastikan pendidikan hak asasi manusia itu berkontribusi kepada membangun masyarakat yang lebih inklusif, lebih setara, dan berkeadilan. Nah, kawan-kawan sekalian mungkin saya ingin menjelaskan sedikit untuk mungkin ada kawan-kawan yang tidak hadir kemarin pada saat pembukaan. Saya akan mengulang saja bahwa ini adalah konferensi yang dilakukan selama tiga hari dan sepenuhnya dilakukan secara daring. Konferensi ini diselenggarakan oleh Datum Indonesia, Kumpulan Ekitas Indonesia, dan ISFORD, Indonesian Scholar Network on Freedom of Religion or Belief, dari mulai kemarin 16 sampai dengan 18 Mei 2023. Dan juga konferensi ini diselenggarakan pada hari yang sama dengan penyelenggaraan International Day for Uh, living in peace. Uh, uh, so that uh, itu sesuatu yang memang uh, sedang ingin kita uh, promosikan bagaimana uh, hidup bersama dalam uh, situasi yang damai, inklusif, uh, toleran, dan juga uh, dalam semangat uh, solidaritas. Karena itu kita menggunakan momen tersebut sekaligus untuk juga bisa uh, mempromosikan nilai-nilai tersebut uh, di dalam kerja-kerja uh, pendidikan hak asasi manusia. Nah, kawan-kawan, uh, uh, kemarin mungkin belum sempat disebutkan bahwa konferensi ini pada dasarnya berbasis aplikasi karena kami menerima lebih dari 122 lebih dari 125 makalah dan kami dari makalah-makalah tersebut ada 68 yang kemudian Maaf, 125 abstrak dan dari 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 abstrak tersebut ada 68 yang kami terima makalahnya sehingga di dalam presentasi keseluruhan proses ini ada lebih dari 60 presenter yang akan menyampaikan paparannya berkaitan dengan pengalaman-pengalaman mereka menyelenggarakan pendidikan hak asasi manusia. Kami berterima kasih banyak kepada Bapak Ibu para panelis yang sudah menyampaikan makalahnya dan dan bersedia untuk apa namanya berbagi pengalaman-pengalaman tersebut. Ada sembilan panel dan dua kuliah umum yang dilakukan di dalam proses ini. Ada sekurang-kurangnya tiga tema baru dibandingkan dengan tahun lalu, yaitu tema yang berkaitan dengan hak asasi pendidikan hak asasi manusia dan anak-anak muda, jadi youth di dalam kerja-kerja uh, pendidikan uh, HAM, kemudian juga tema mengenai pendidikan HAM untuk masyarakat adat dan dari masyarakat adat, itu tema baru juga yang kami bawa di, di, di dalam uh, panel diskusi kita. Yang lain lagi adalah uh, pendidikan hak asasi manusia dalam konteks SDGs, jadi um, uh, bagaimana mengkaitkan antara pendidikan HAM dengan uh, pembangunan yang lebih uh, berkeadilan. Itu kami sediakan panel khusus untuk untuk itu. Nah, bersama-sama dengan kita di dalam pagi ini, kita akan mendengarkan kuliah umum. Jadi, sebagaimana biasa, pada tahun lalu kami juga menyelenggarakan kuliah umum. Tahun lalu kita ada Bung Nur Fauzi Rahman, dan tahun ini kita, kita sangat beruntung karena kita mendapatkan kesediaan dari Ibu Profesor Felisa Tibit, sudah bersama-sama dengan kita pagi ini. Uh, terima kasih kehadiran Ibu untuk di, uh, ikut serta di dalam uh, sesi ka, uh, kami. Uh, mungkin saya akan men menyampaikan beberapa uh, apa namanya biodata singkat beliau. Beliau akan nanti menyampaikan uh, pandangan berkaitan dengan uh, kecenderungan atau tren pendidikan hak asasi manusia di uh, tingkat uh, global. Jadi paparan tersebut sudah di pre-record dan kita nanti akan mendengarkan bersama-sama kurang lebih satu jam paparan dari Ibu Felisa. Ibu Profesor Felisa Tibit adalah Ketua Bidang Hak Asasi Manusia dan Pendidikan Tinggi di UNESCO. Beliau juga Kepala Bidang Pendidikan HAM di Departemen Hukum, Ekonomi, dan Pemerintahan di Universitas Utrecht dan Ajun Profesor di Institut Studi Hak Asasi Manusia di Universitas Columbia. Uh, untuk para aktivis yang lama-lama uh, tahun 90-an mungkin tahu Ibu Felisa adalah salah seorang pendiri uh, apa namanya Herea ya uh, Human Rights Education 
uh, Human Rights Education Associates ya uh, tahun 96 itu salah satu salah satu uh, apa namanya uh, website yang selama ini menjadi referensi kalau misalnya para pendidik HAM mencari materi-materi kita selalu carinya di Herea. Jadi kami mungkin mengenal uh, Ibu Felisa dari dari Herea dan uh, sampai dengan saat ini beliau masih tetap aktif uh, uh, di sana. Uh, beliau uh, meminati uh, bidang hak asasi manusia dan pendidikan kewarganegaraan demokratis, reformasi kurikulum, pedagogi kritis, pendidikan dan gerakan sosial, serta hak asasi manusia dalam konteks transformasi pendidikan uh, tinggi. Uh, dan beliau sudah menerbitkan cukup banyak materi-materi uh, pendidikan HAM yang berkaitan dengan kurikulum, pengembangan program, dan evaluasi, baik itu untuk kepentingan UNESCO, UNICEF, OECD, dan berbagai organisasi lain, termasuk organisasi non-pemerintah seperti Amnesty dan Open Society Foundation. Selamat mengikuti presentasinya, kawan-kawan. Hello, my name is Felisa Tibbets, and I'm UNESCO Chair in Human Rights and Higher Education, and Human Rights Education Chair at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you today. I'm really grateful to the organizers, and I'm delighted that you are interested in human rights education. So what I'm doing in this presentation today, which is pre-recorded, is going to be spending about an hour overviewing for you international trends in human rights education. These may be trends that you've observed yourself. Um, they may be new to you but I would like you to locate your own interests and experiences within the wider frame of the international human rights education movement. Um, so I am in New York City and I am recording this so that we can be kind of certain or more certain that we won't have any technical issues with my connecting with you live. After this presentation, I will be joining you live and that'll give us an opportunity to have some discussion. So I'm really looking forward to having some interaction with you um, on your interests and your experiences in human rights education. So with that, let me go ahead and get my slides. Here we go. And let me just move to the beginning of this slide. Hold on, see, sorry. Here we go. That looks all right. Okay trends in human rights education and that's my email address and it's a sincere invitation to you to be in touch with me if you have questions or needs that you think I might be able to help you with. Um, Google translation is amazing so even if you're not able to communicate in English it's very possible that I'll be able to sort out your email to me so please feel free to be in touch with me. Okay, let's here we go. So the first trend that I'd like to uh, mention to you is a trend in general in relation to human rights topics, and human rights education in the schooling systems. Not all of you are working in the schooling system, but for those of you who are, just so you know, it's really quite a, very, a, a dramatic development over the last 30 years in terms of the number of times, the frequency with which we now see human rights as a term showing up in national curricula, and also, not surprisingly, inside of textbooks or other resources that are available to educators to use in their teaching. So you can see in the slide in front of you um, some of the um, statistics around this. This, these are from 2017, like over 83 countries having adopted human rights education and legislation, policy documents, and curricula. Since that time, I don't expect that the numbers have gone down, despite some, uh, despite the sort of pushback against human rights and the shrinking of civic space that we're seeing in, mother, in many countries. The reason why I don't think that these statistics are going down is actually related to a challenge for human rights education in schools, which is that when human rights is referenced, sometimes it's a very superficial or very narrow reference. For example, the establishment of the United Nations and the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So what I would say in terms of this trend is that we're seeing human rights more as a kind of regular discourse 
in many, many national education systems. And the challenge inside of those systems is to have a more substantive and quality treatment of human rights so that it's really an analytical framework, a lens that can be used to improve society as opposed to just legal standards or historical facts. Now, of course, there are countries in which human rights is a dirty word. Um, so there's no question about that. But in general, the trend across all regions, although less so in the Middle East, is that we're gonna see more human rights in the curriculum, which presents terrific opportunities for educators to use this framework to think about social justice and um, social justice and um, an improvement of society along human rights values. I'd like to go um, step back a little bit and describe to you what's happened in this field over the last 30 years. That's when I got involved about 30 years ago. My personal story with human rights education is that I was one of those people interested in peace education, um, education for democratic citizenship. I'm still interested in these areas, but I really hadn't thought about human rights and, and certainly not human rights education. What happened was the Berlin Wall came down and there's that whole region in Central and Eastern Europe and post-Soviet Europe where um, Marxist-Leninism or something similar to that had been taught. And there was now the opportunity to have citizenship education with human rights values. So at that time I was working for a Dutch human rights group, the Netherlands Helsinki Committee, and my colleagues were human rights lawyers who were working with prosecutors and judges and <laughs> very traditional kinds of work um, in human rights and human rights education, I might add. But I was working in the schooling sector. And that early experience of trying to work in the schooling sector without a lot of materials actually available for everyday education about human rights. And I mean that sort of a popularized version of human rights, not just human rights for lawyers. So there's such a deficit of information at that time. It became clear to me that there, that there were very, there were like at that time, two very distinct, what I call now roots to human rights education. The first route, which was fairly well developed and quite um, elitist in fact, was the treatment of human rights from a legal perspective only. Of course, it's really important to have some understanding of the legal standards related to human rights. Even in the schooling sector, this is something that students should at least be aware that these exist. Um, but in the 1990s, at that time, if there was human rights education taking place, typically it was not at the secondary school level or earlier in one's career in schools, it was only at universities and it was in law schools specifically. So at that time, not surprisingly, of course, inside there was international human rights law and that was pretty much what was happening in human rights education. There were a few exceptions, but not too many. Amnesty International was not doing a lot of human rights education there. The UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was only established in 1994. To give you an idea, there was a time when we didn't have that member of the UN family. So when I started to work in the schooling sector, um, and I was linking up with people at that time at Amnesty who also became interested, we realized that we needed to look elsewhere than law schools for ideas about how to do human rights education. And that brought us to actually popular education in Latin America because during the dictatorship period, there was a lot of resistance, um, underground resistance to authoritarianism. And some of that looked like human rights education it was very creative, it was popular, it was non-formal. In the Philippines also, there had been a massive effort to introduce peace education through non-formal education. So there were places we could look, but this was a very different kind of approach to teaching human rights or learning about human rights than in law schools. So the origins of human rights education back then was again, popular resistance versus law related education. And at this point, um, let me see what my next slide has. No, at this point, 
I think that we found a kind of happy a marriage between these two approaches, but it has taken some time. So in the law school sector, you can have still what I would call traditional lecture-oriented courses in, in international human rights law, but there are also increasing numbers of clinics in law schools where students interested in human rights and its application can um, actually uh, participate in experience-based um, learning around human rights. In this case, for example, it could be educating others about human rights, that's a street law type clinical legal education program, or um, working directly with vulnerable populations and providing legal advice. This can be part of the, the human rights experience in law school. So law schools have also moved a little bit towards experiential. Um, and in terms of what's happening in non-formal education in the schooling sector, here we see much more creative approaches to human rights education. And any of you who are working in the schooling sector in human rights education already, you might already be aware of you know, the participatory methods, learner-centered approaches, and so forth. This gets back to sort of the origins of human rights um, and Paulo Freire and this notion that human rights should be liberating, it should be revealing ways in which our societies need to be improved and motivating people to do so. So now I think these have really come together. And of course you do have some legal standards introduced in schools. It's a question of when that gets introduced, how much is given to students and which particular standards because there's so many of them. So which ones do you focus on? So I, so I think the popular education model, the, the, the law related approach have really come together um, there is critiques, actually, of what is called the legal literacy approach outside of law schools. So when I was working first in the field 30 years ago, there were some people doing non-formal human rights education, maybe not in, they're not in schools, but with other groups, groups other than lawyers, and many of them were just focusing on like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and what it was all about. That's called the legal literacy approach, where the focus is just the documents and knowledge of the documents. Um, and that approach is critiqued. Why? Because if you present that kind of information to people who are not lawyers, it's not clear what that means for your own life. It's not clear what you can be doing to help in, you know, infuse human rights values or goals into your work as a regular person or in your job or whatever context in which you're exposed to human rights. So, um, so although there is this legal stream uh, inside of human rights education, um, it's to exclusively focus on that, especially outside of law schools has been critiqued by Kate, who is a South African um, a human rights education specialist. So now I'm shifting to another trend. This is the trend related to the United Nations and human rights education. There has been a kind of evolution inside of the United Nations around HRE, which is really, really fascinating, at least to me. <laughs> so, um, because if you just entered the field now, you might think that it's always been, that is human rights education, has always been of like keen interest to the UN and member states, not the case. So if we go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its preamble, or in this case, I have a quote in front of you from the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, we see there in this, in the, so this is like in the 40s and the 1960s, we, that's some time ago, isn't it? Anyway, way back then, <laughs> we saw a general reference to education and an acknowledgement by the United Nations that education, quote, shall strengthen the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and that education shall enable all persons to participate effectively in a free society. So very clear, very clear language around the importance of education in regards to UN values like human rights, but not much more detail than simply this. So it's a kind of a nod to the importance of education, but no guidance 
if you will, per se. But this is how um, I see the progression of education and the UN at the UN around human rights has evolved. So the first is what I just mentioned to you, the general reference to education as strengthening respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now, in the 1980s, we had first the Declaration on the Rights of the Child, and then the Convention on the Rights of the Child, so it became a treaty. And once the focus of the United Nations, at that time, the Human Rights Committee um, and member states interested in this topic, once they became focused on children's rights, it was kind of inevitable that they would spend some time then focusing on right to education. What does it mean for a child to have a right to education? What, what is good education? Um, what does it mean to have a right? It means access, it means availability, it means accessibility in terms of if you have any physical or mental um, uh, you know, disabilities or lack of ableness that would impede your being able to enjoy your right to education, but quality education as well. I mean, we want education not to foster um, hate towards any groups or othering, right? Of groups or other countries. And moreover, specifically, um, in the right to education, which was elaborated through the CRC and the human rights-based approach to education, we saw that quality education increasingly became clearer in regards to human rights education. That quality education is, is also has content related to education for human rights and respect for fundamental freedoms. So what happened is with the CRC and the focus on the right to education, and, and it continues to this day, there became more of a focus on what is quality education and human rights came into the picture. So as I mentioned already, it came into the picture in terms of thinking about teaching and learning and that there should be some content related to education, you know, promotion of fundamental freedoms and democracy, but also, the human rights-based approach to education um, provided additional incentives for thinking about not only teaching and learning processes, but the wider environment in the school that might um, influence both teachers and their learners' experiences in daily life in the school around processes and values associated with human rights. So let me explain what I mean by that and a little bit on the human rights based approach, um, because this is also part of the progression of thinking about education and human rights in the United Nations. So the rights based approach, the human rights based approach um, in the United Nations originally began with a focus on development. So development actors, including the UN Development Program, but also others working in the field of development, humanitarian emergencies, were called to carry out their programming in ways that were um, explicitly linked with human rights standards and which would reflect human rights values. Very interesting, and I love the human rights-based approach. So for example, um, it would mean that if you were doing development work, instead of just saying access to water, you would maybe characterize the goal of your project as the right to water or the right to clean water, right to health, et cetera. Moreover, the ways in which you carried out your programming in, in the development sector should reflect human rights values such as non-discrimination, empowerments of rights holders, transparency and accountability. And if you were in, if we, if you're interested in our Q and A after my presentation, we could talk a little bit about that. But in terms of education sector, this um, wonderful holistic approach to programming and the organizations carrying out that programming uh, migrated over to schooling sector. So UNICEF and UNESCO both came out with this really, really nice publication on the human rights-based approach to schooling and to education. And in it, they elaborated on all the ways in which schools should, in addition to teaching about human rights, also think about ways of, of, of organizing the school life so that the human rights and dignity of all would be respected. So, um, so education and the educational environment was taken into account. And again, happy to speak more about the human rights-based approach, but this was also something that came in 
alongside a focus on the right to education from within the United Nations that allowed us to not only think about human rights education in teaching and learning, but again, um, the culture of respect in schools, opportunities for students to influence decision making in the school, addressing violence and bullying in the school, community partnerships. These were some of the things that came out of thinking about the rights-based approach and schooling. But that's not the end of the story with the UN's, if I can say it, love affair with human rights education, because it's become really apparent as human rights education has taken off and as it's, as it's migrated, moved into schooling systems, as it continues to be debated and discussed by people in ministries of education, by scholars, by NGOs um, wanting to do really liberating human rights education, as it's become much more vibrant and, and rich and deep in terms of our understanding of its potentiality, the United Nations has also recognized and I think um, this, I am personally convinced by this, the UN has recognized that the entire human rights system of the United Nations essentially depends on human rights education and training. This is because the virtuous cycle of rights holders knowing the rights to be able to claim them and duty bearers knowing what human rights standards they have obligations to uphold, all of that depends on knowledge sharing, right? So if we believe, and if you have any belief in the UN system around human rights and human rights mechanisms, as I do, and I know the critiques of the United Nations, we'll get to that. But if there's any, if we want, if we have any faith in the human rights mechanisms in the UN system, one of the criteria for those, that virtuous cycle of duty bearers, you know, being accountable to rights holders for fulfilling their rights. Um, if we have any faith in that, then we know that, that both duty bearers and rights holders need to know what those human rights obligations are. It's very, very simple, right? So the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in particular is very sure that human rights education is fundamental for, um, for all. And they have been the engine for driving um, you know, the standards related to human rights education in general, working through the Human Rights Council inside of the United Nations. And they were, for example, working with the Human Rights Council's writing committee on the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, which came out a little over 10 years ago. And although there is, there is no existing quote unquote right to him, human rights education, as I'll show you in a in, in a in a couple of minutes, there is language that's very very close um, to ensuring human rights education is a right. Very very close, and there are some people, maybe they're in the minority, but there are some people in the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights who think it's just a matter of time before we actually have a treaty on human rights education. In the meantime, we have a declaration on human rights education and training. We have a permanent ongoing world program for human rights education. And we also have um, the, well, we've got SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 4.7, which has human rights education inside and let's see, what else do we have? And we have, as new treaties are promulgated, we're seeing human rights education specifically mentioned in regards to the treaty, a kind of thou shalt phrase um, that commits any country that signs and ratifies a treaty to ensure that citizens and people on its territory are aware that the government has obligated itself to, ob to uphold that human rights treaty. For example, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is the most recent treaty, human rights treaty. And that treaty has very, very clear language around human rights education needing to be carried out to inform everyone about the convention and its, um, and its characteristics. So, so we are seeing, again, more and more of an infusion of human rights education and training inside 
the work of the UN through the rights-based approach, through moving towards a right to human rights education, the declaration, um, but also new treaties that are being promulgated. That's really, really remarkable. A lot of evolution um, over the last 30 years. And I don't know if we're gonna get a treaty. Um, just as an aside, you know, there are a lot of treaties and governments that sign onto treaties are obligated to do reports every you know four and a half five years something along those lines and it's seen as burdensome by some countries especially countries that have relatively lower fewer, fewer resources all this reporting is, is is a kind of a pain in the neck um, and the idea of the reporting of course it's related to self-monitoring it's related to an opportunity for governments to to for themselves reflect upon their own progress in delivering, you know, this human right. Um, of course, this is all idealized, of course, but in principle, this is what should be happening. Um, but, but it's a lot of reports for countries that sign on to lots of human rights treaties, lots of reports to do. Maybe they don't do the reports. Maybe they de are delayed in doing the reports. There's something now called the Universal Periodic Review. I'm going to introduce you to it if you haven't heard of it before, because it may be the future of human rights reporting, which in my opinion, only my opinion, I assure you, might influence um, an openness to having a, a new treaty on the right to human rights education, because it couldn't, it wouldn't necessarily require that that have a separate report. So the Universal Periodic Review was established now, I think around, oh, maybe 15 years ago or so, it's amazing. It's required of every member state of the United Nations. You cannot opt out. It's a four and a half year cycle. The Universal Periodic Review is a review of a country's, it's a report card done by this, the government on its own, on its own activities related to human rights. It's also possible to have stakeholder or sh shadow reports, if you will, submitted by civil society organizations in that country. Um, and of course, the UN is also collecting data from their own you know, statistics they're collecting for different countries. So, but the, what's really cool about the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, is that that review is not, in the eyes of the United Nations, restricted to those treaties that, is, that a country has signed and ratified. That means, for example, in the United States, where I'm based, we can discuss human rights related to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, which the U.S. has not signed on to. Similarly, the U.S. has not ratified the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> but because it's the Universal Periodic Review and basically the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the foundational document for these reviews, it means that we in the United States, as stakeholders anyway, can submit stakeholder reports on the U.S. performance on these ECOSOC areas or human rights education areas, even though there's no treaty that the U.S. has signed and ratified in regards to this. So I've submitted at this point, three UPR stakeholder reports on the status of human rights education in the United States. One was on the schooling sector and the other was in higher education. So um, I mentioned this, first of all, so that you are aware of the UPR. If you are interested in human rights education, and I assume you are because you're listening to me, you're in this webinar, be aware that in terms of nudging your own government to do more human rights education, that um, that you might be interested to submit a kind of stakeholder report um, or, or assist the government <laughs> in doing a review of human rights education in your own country. There's no reason why you can't do it. You have to weigh the pros and cons of that, of that effort. It does take time to prepare a stakeholder report, um, but we know uh, in the United States, a part of the reason that we did it because it helped us in the NGO sector to strategize how to, to better support and advance human rights education in the US. So our kind of uh, our analysis of the status of human rights education in the US and the report that we prepared also gave, and which included recommend, recommendations that we submitted to 
our government here in the US, um, those recommendations also included things that we in the NGO sector could keep in mind for our own strategies to promote HRE. So that means that whatever country you're in, um, you might also um, pay attention to the universal periodic review cycles and to see if there maybe there's already a recommendation made for your country to carry out human rights education. It happens. Some countries get a specific recommendation to do it. Sometimes it's just for a certain sector like the police if there are no problems, but nevertheless, a recommendation. But even if there's no recommendation from an earlier universal periodic review um, cycle, you can still you can still submit a stakeholder report on human rights education. You would submit it to your government in the US, we submitted it to the State Department, it would be your foreign policy department. We also submit it directly to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which coordinates the UPR review process. So, so UPR, good strategy for you to, in terms of thinking about HRE in your own country. And I mention it also because if um, the Universal Periodic Review um, enthusiasts um, have their way, it's possible, totally unofficially, totally unofficial, but it's possible that the countries will in the future only submit one report, and that's the Universal Periodic Review. They may no longer have to submit reports to specific committees for each of the treaties they've signed and ratified. That's not going to happen in the near future, but it's being discussed because, you know, the UPR is so holistic and it would be, it would, it would ease the burden on countries in terms of report writing. And that means that there'd be less of a reason to object to there being a right to human rights education. Okay, so now let's talk about another trend or evolution inside of the field of human rights education. And that is our understanding, our collective understanding about what is human rights education and what is quality human rights education. So what I'm sharing in front of you and which I will be going into in some detail because it's the definition if we unpack it, says a lot about what is quality human rights education, what its potentiality is. So this is the definition of human rights education, which is in the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, again, came out in 2011. And uh, so let's go through this. The first aspect of this definition is that the United Nations basically grabs onto any potential learning environment as an environment in which human rights education and training or human rights learning could happen. That means the formal education system, kindergarten through secondary school, university level. It means all kinds of professional trainings once you're in the workforce, the kind of what's called in-service training for teachers, for others, police, that's also part of the human rights education landscape in a country. Non-formal education, not only for professionals, but also like in youth clubs or weekends, or maybe human rights education taking place inside of a religious institution that happens, but also informal learning that happens by reading the digital news, listening to the radio, basically any place where learning can take place, um, whether it's structured learning or kind of ad hoc, eligible to be considered a place where human rights learning can take place. So it's, but it's something here to bear in mind, it's not just the schooling system. In fact, the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, notice and training was added. Why? Because there was a kind of an over um, identification of human rights education being only for schools, and it's not the case. It's important, of course, but not only in schools is human rights education supposed to be happening. So that's the one point. Second, second paragraph here you can see aimed at promoting universal respect and observance of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. That's the mantra we've seen since the, you know, the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the nod to the importance of education for promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms. So this is a, a recurring theme that we see 
in UN documents. But here we see another point related to human rights education, super important. It should be contributing to the prevention of human rights violations. There's a word missing there that's important, violations, not prevention of human rights. Prevention of human rights violations. That means it is not enough just to learn about human rights, you know, like a fact. It needs to be offered to learners in such a way that it's relevant, it's motivating, that it will potentially result in behaviors where the learner works for human rights for themselves or in solidarity with others, um, or if they're a duty bearer, or that's one of the, you know, the ways in which they're working in the world, they're rights holder and they're a duty bearer, of course, you can hear both. Duty bearer, they will understand how to integrate human rights into the, the roles and responsibility of their jobs. So it's really, there's got to be some residue. It's not a checkbox of knowing about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is the challenge for we human rights educators to carry it out in such a way that it is relevant and motivating. And that's, that's our challenge. Um, and it's a good challenge because that means we move beyond just a superficial knowledge of human rights. Um, continuing on the definition, we see at the end of this definition, an acknowledgement of what we in educator, education know already, that there are different domains for learner outcomes. One is knowledge and understanding, it's cognitive. Like we know there's gotta be something in the HRE related to the UDHR or the Convention on the Rights of the Child or CEDAW or whatever international human rights standards, legal standards are relevant for your learner group. And part of your discernment as an educator is to figure out, okay, if I can only focus on one, which one most relevant for my learners. So the knowledge is one dimension of the learner outcomes you identify. And there's a lot of learning that can be associated with the international human rights system and the regional human rights systems. No question about it. But then there's also skills related to HRE. Um, and the skills and behavior sets will depend on the learning program. But the skill sets might involve being able to analyze and apply human rights principles to the workplace in which you're you're working um, to the roles and responsibilities that you carry out as a police officer, as a health worker, as a teacher. So the very specifics, or if you're in a if you're a youth learning about human rights, then perhaps it's a skill set related to your being able to identify problems in your community and to develop strategies for addressing them. Right. So um, so there's some, if you will, even some competencies related to your understanding of human rights and you're being able to address them in a very real and concrete way in the environment in which you're living, or it might also be something you're doing more online in a global community, it just all depends, right? But the third domain and final domain is also um, attitudes. So values and attitudes. Now we can't happily just socialize our learners to have human rights values. And this is a, a good time for me to say, Human rights education can not be and should not be a top-down, take it or leave it ideology. We don't want ideology. We want to introduce human rights as a discourse, as a way of, of thinking about justice, right? And human dignity. And the human rights mechanisms and the legal standards are very powerful tools and they're very focused on government behavior but there are different ways to promote like, social change so when i'm teaching human rights education for example to prospective teachers I, I i usually want to relax them right at the beginning of the course and say listen you may not be someone who's convinced about the human rights discourse but you're probably very values driven you're in my course so your values maybe you call those values social justice um feminism um, peace, anti-racism, non-discrimination, whatever value, whatever frame you use, perfectly fine. There's, you should still understand what is the human rights discourse and those values and think about how using those might be an asset to your own social change efforts or your own 
teaching for you know critical pedagogy right so um so the values and attitudes piece coming back to that is such that all of our learners already have values and attitudes all we can do is try to um you know maybe peel back the layers so that they re-examine those values and see if those values how those values might be linked with human rights and in the ways in which human rights might you know enrich their own understanding of how they can see their positionality in the world and try to make make change so again the final part of the un definition for human rights education this is why i wanted to deconstruct it with you because there's a lot here that's really important for us in human rights education is to recognize knowledge um, skills and attitudes as all part of human rights education also um, another way of putting it is that human rights education is about the head, it's about the heart, and it's about the hands, right? Doing doing the actual work, right? Very important. Okay, and I'm just throwing this in because I really like the Amnesty International def definition of human rights education. Um, it's a little bit different, but very consistent with the UN one. It defines human rights education as a deliberative participatory process aimed at empowering individuals, groups, and communities, et cetera. You can read the rest yourself. But they mentioned specifically the process as being participatory and working towards empowerment. Very, very important. So moving beyond the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to directly just putting it out there that HRE should be participatory, and it should be around empowerment. And we'll discuss that a little bit more. I'll present that a little bit more in this uh, later in this presentation. So here, let's, let's just look briefly at a couple of articles in the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training. So this is the, this is the quote um, that I kind of referred to earlier where I said it wasn't quite right to human rights education, but it's pretty darn close. So here we see Article 1.1, everyone has the right to know, seek, and receive information about all human rights and fundamental freedoms and should have access to human rights education and training. Wow, that is really clear, right? So it's not right to human rights education, but pretty close. Those of us who are giving input to the writing committee when this was being worked on, honestly, we were surprised. It, it came out this strong. But you can see why it's just a small step to a right to human rights education. In the meantime, we have this language. All governments, all member states of the United Nations are obligated to ensure that everyone has basically access to human rights education. And Article 7.1 specifically reminds governments that they are the ones with the primary responsibility to promote and ensure human rights education and training. And why is that? That is because only governments can sign and ratify treaties, right? If you think about treaties like, you know, peace treaties, well, human rights treaties are like that, that they're signed between governments, in this case, government sign, you know, inside the body of the United Nations. So technically speaking, um, governments have the, have the primary responsibility to HR, to do HRE because it's linked up from the UN perspective with the treaties they've obligated themselves to, you know, to, op to uphold. But if we think about, you know, the human rights system more widely, if we think about everyday people, and um, and their co potential contact with human rights and human rights ways of knowing and, and living, then it's uh, it's clear that it's not just governments involved in this, but potentially others who are working with these kinds of people, that is everyday people. And that brings us to the civil society sector. I think it's indisputable that it is the civil society sector, including NGOs, that has been the primary engine for advancing human rights education. And that's not surprising because civil society organizations interested in human rights education are very values driven. They're not necessarily going to have 
more or less interest in human rights because there's a new politician elected. Governments have to navigate these changes in politics. And you know, if you think about your own country, you know what I'm talking about. There's some environment, there's some times in history where it's a little, it's easier to talk about human rights because at the highest levels of government, there's an interest in it. And, um, but there are other times when it's not as easy. Maybe human rights is associated with a political party that's now an opposition party. So with governments, it's not, even though officially and on paper, government should always be promoting human rights because they have, regardless of their political profile at any given time, they've signed and ratified human rights treaties. They have to report on them. They're supposed to be letting people know in their country what rights they have vis-a-vis -vis these treaties. So that should be the case. But in fact, it's not always the case, or we have problems with quality. So civil society organizations um, have been very engaged in human rights education. Um, again, I said earlier, statistically speaking, we are seeing more and more in national curriculum and textbooks and resources, which is terrific. But we also have longstanding allyship um, and service delivery in human rights education through the non-governmental or organizations and civil society organizations that are including NGOs, but others as well. The ones that are most active now, Amnesty International, which has, you know, they have um, human rights education in their um, across uh, in their headquarters, although they've, they've, re they've decentralized, so it's not just one headquarters now, their HRE office is in Oslo, but they have a, a whole network inside of Amnesty International sections and structures um, where they're, they're carrying out human rights education at the national level. So Amnesty International, and they have an online learning program called the Human Rights Academy, it's terrific. Um, they're very involved in human rights education. My um, NGO, Human Rights Education Associates, um, is very involved in HRE through, well, online learning, um, our online resource center, um, and other organizations that don't have human rights in their uh, as, a, as a main um, frame are still um, potentially involved in human rights education. So there are educational organizations that are interested in social justice in the United States using human rights language. We also have straight up human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, which is involved in HRE as a, as a kind of a program a sub-program and what they're involved in. So there's different ways in which uh, NGOs are involved in, in, in human rights education in addition to states. And it's um, and again, you know, the degree to which NGOs are involved depends partly on the political environment and their opportunities and also funding because they are, many NGOs are, you know, do scramble for funding and that can influence the amount of HRE that can be offered. But in any case, Whatever country you are in, your government is responsible for carrying out, primarily responsible for carrying out human rights education. And of course, governments, what are their hands on? Their hands are on um, public sector educational institutions. So public schools, kindergarten through 12, public universities. Um, and those public universities also include trainings you know, pre-service training of professionals. So that's also very important to, to keep in mind. Of course, governments that are keen on human rights education can make funding available for nonprofits, for NGOs to carry out HRE, so that could happen. Um, but right now, I think primarily the UN is, is happy if the governments are focused on carrying out HRE in, in form, inside of their own um, public, um, education institutions. I mentioned the World Program for Human Rights Education earlier. The World Program began in 2005 following the decade for human rights education. So when the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights was established in 1994, already the next year, 1995, um, they um, initiated the decade for human rights education. And it was ambitious because it was still very a very young time, if you will, in the international human rights education uh, movement. Uh, it was still 
it, there still wasn't a whole lot going on. So unsurprisingly, at the end of the decade, only a small number of countries were reporting that they were doing human rights education, really not surprising. And sometimes when they were reporting that, they were only reporting what a few NGOs were doing. It wasn't actually the government directly for your information. But um, at the end of the decade, not to be discouraged, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights said, listen, let's establish a permanent world program for human rights education. They proposed that accepted by the General Assembly. And so what happens now is that every four and a half years, so the World Program for Human Rights Education, which um, influenced the language of the Declaration, the Declaration for Human Rights Education and Training came later, but the World Program influenced the Declaration because it really, again, acknowledged that human rights education and training can happen in the formal education sector, the non-formal, the informal. And so that's a lot to cover. And so what they did, um, what they, um, the decision was taken at the United Nations to have phases for the world program. The phases would call attention to member states around a certain sector, like a target group or a theme to focus on for that phase. Phases lasted, again, four and a half years, thereabouts. It doesn't mean, the phase doesn't, it's not required for governments, it's just suggested, it doesn't, intend to discourage governments from doing human rights education in other areas. It's just a way to kind of remind governments again to nudge them, hey, there's a world program for human rights education. And by the way, maybe you might think about a special focus in the next upcoming years on this learner group or this topic, right? Okay, so that's the backdrop. So phase one, 2005, the schooling system. Um, phase two, moving up into the formal education sector, university level, professional training institutions, and then very specific professional groups, including teachers, law enforcement officials, and civil servants. Very interesting. Um, phase three, the focus was on media professionals and journalists. Very interesting. So here, even, you know, citizen journalists and um, and so this is primarily the non-formal education sector. You know, the earlier one was formal education. Now we moved into the non-formal education sector with a focus on the very, very important work that journalists, online journalists, and also traditional journalists play in bringing our attention to human rights violations and human rights needs, but also educating their readers and listeners at the same time about what are human rights. Really, really, really important. Phase four which we are wrap we are now at the wrapping up next year i think phase four was focusing on youth it was i think it was brilliant because a few years ago with the climate um chain with the climate crisis and within the united states with youth um, organizing themselves to um to promote the banning of assault weapons in the United States. We saw a lot of youth activism. We're still seeing a lot of youth activism. I think that's what influenced um, youth being the focus of phase four. So how can member states, how can the United Nations support youth learning about human rights education, especially as it influences their potential engagement in human rights advocacy, right? Phase five, well, the U U Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights this very month has organized an online consultation from anyone. That means you, you can go on the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights website. You can just Google Human Rights Education and Training, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and you will be able, I believe, to find the page which presents the, world pro the background on the world program, you know, the other phases, and the opportunity to click and to submit your opinion about which learner group or groups and or themes um, you would like to be a focus of the phase five. My NGO, HREA, Human Rights Education Associates, we have organized an online consultation through our network. Um, but you can also just do it directly um, uh, with the High Commissioner's Office. And uh, so that's exciting. I, I, I have to say, I, um, I'm, we're still getting input from 
our listserv members, our network members, our deadline for that is May 17th. Um, and then um, we're going to be doing uh, a kind of report, a short report for the High Commissioner um, overviewing the results and seeing what trends we have. So World Program for Human Rights Education, Alive and Well. Now, I'm not with you live right now, so I can't, I can't organize a pair share for you. But since you're listening to this, maybe you're able to do it. So let me just say that if you are listening to this in a room where there's a colleague next to you, or you're like with other people, I'd like to invite you to turn to the person next to you and, it, and explain to them when you first learned about human rights. Not when you just heard about human rights, but when you first learned about human rights, okay? So that means that if you are in a, a room with people that you turn to them and you have this conversation for like, like three or four minutes and whoever is sharing this video with you can just click, click the, the pause button while you do this, okay? Now, if you are not with anyone else in a live room, then I would just like to invite you to consider, when did you first learn about human rights? Well, when do you remember really, really learning about, about human rights, okay? So, um, I'm gonna ask who's ever sharing the video to pause, for you to think for a minute about when you first learned about human rights or three minutes to share with someone next to you, okay? And then we'll come back to my presentation, you in this virtual room. But it, I'm very interested to know how many of you first learned about human rights at university versus some of you may be learning about human rights already at secondary school or even primary schools. So we know that human rights, human rights education is is filtering more and more, as trickling into the into schooling sector. So when did you first learn about human rights? And maybe it wasn't even in a schooling sec in a, in the schools or in a school. It could be that you learned about human rights through conversations with family members. I have a lot of students who, or I've had students in the past who, who learned about human rights or came to human rights because of their family's history with the Holocaust. Um, so sometimes it's through a, 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 a history, a family history related to genocide or persecution of some kind and, and discussions in the family that leads a young person to become aware of human rights and really begin to learn about human rights. It could be something else that happens not in schools, outside of schools, that opens your eyes to discrimination or violation of human rights. You maybe not have that language when you first learn about human rights, but you become aware of this injustice and you become deeply disturbed and care about it. And eventually, you know, you are learning about human rights in relation to that. So when I asked this question, when you first learned about human rights 30 years ago, or even 25 years ago, almost without exception, the only place people learned about human rights was in university. That's different now. Typically, People are learning some in university, some in secondary school, some even in primary school. So it's much more diverse now, reflecting the evolution of HRE. Um, of course, other people learn it in their families or through friends, that's understood. But there has, it used to be just at university. And this is one of the amazing trends in human rights education as far as I'm concerned. Now, when you think about your first experience learning about human rights, I, I, I'm not going to ask you to speak to the person next to you, for those who, of you who are in a room with other people, but I'd like you to reflect, just reflect on this first experience that you had. What was the nature of this learning about human rights? Was it in school? Was it non-formal, like a club in school or outside of school? Was it informal through parents, friends, just reading the news? What was the content? Was it focusing on children's rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights related to women, girls? Was there an experiential or action-oriented aspect to it? Was it more? Is, was it more than just reading? 
and potentially discussing. Was there anything hands-on related to your human rights learning? And when you look back, was it a good learning experience? When you look back, you think, oh, that was really motivating. Or when you look back, was it like, hmm, I mean, it was okay, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't really, you know, it was, it was not a enlarged an explanation for how I got into to human rights or, or it didn't really, you know, um, in, introduce me to human rights in a way that was super motivating. So I want you to just think about how you learned about human rights, because we do have a gold standard for teaching human rights education, which I'm going to present in a moment. Before I do that, I also want to mention um, or acknowledge that um, insofar as some of us are learning human rights in university, some are learning it in secondary school, some are learning it in primary, some are learning it in the family first, right? But if we don't have human rights education in basic education, that is the required schooling that our countries, um, you know, requ are, are require young people to participate in, whether it's 16 years of schooling or eight years of schooling or 18 years, if it doesn't happen then, human rights education, it means there's no guarantee that everyday people will learn about human rights. So 30 years ago, it was only people studying law that, human, that knew about human rights. That is really shocking when you think that human rights education is about people knowing their rights to be able to claim them. If we have any faith in the international human rights system and we understand that learning about one's rights or obligations as a duty bearer is fundamental to that, we must have human rights education in the formal schooling sector while people are in school. Otherwise it's elitist. It's just for the people going to university. And those are not necessary, they're not only they're not only a subset of society. They may be not amongst those who are the most vulnerable in our societies who really, really need to know about their human rights in order to be able to claim them and advocate for them. So I just wanna make that point, pushing the importance of human rights education. And then I've just mentioned, as I said, the quality of human rights education. So this language about what is human rights education um, in terms of the aims is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Education and Training. And this is beautiful language, education about, through and for human rights. What does it mean? It means that the gold standard of human rights education is A, it obviously includes content about international human rights standards, the rights-based approach. Education through human rights means it matters how we deliver human rights education, how we experience human rights education as a learner. In any environment in which human rights education is taking place, the rights, the dignity of everyone involved should be respected. That includes the educator as well as the learners. It should be an atmosphere of mutual respect. There should be not violence, bullying. There should not be humiliation. There should be incredible res you know, mutual respect amongst all the learners. It, and um, it also means that how we learn about human rights will be, should be learner-centered participatory, ideally even experiential, because we want people to move into not just thinking about human rights, but again, feeling it and getting skills or motivation, you know, to be active in the future around promoting and protecting human rights. Education for human rights speaks for itself. At the end, there should be a residue that our learners are knowing about human rights they feel it, human rights is aligned with their own value system, ideally, um, and what they're doing in their professional position, if they're learning human rights in relation to their professions, and that there'll be some after effect of the learning uh, of human rights. It won't just be knowledge that comes and maybe is forgotten, to be honest with you. So human rights education, there's also been a more and more scholarship on human rights education. Another trend, more and more scholars, we have two journals uh, for now for human rights education, the Human Rights Education Review, 
out of a university in Norway, and International Human Rights Education Journal coming out of a university in the United States. So we have more and more scholarship, which is terrific. We just want, and, and so if you are someone who's interested to do research in human rights education, there's more now than there ever was. Um, there's always a challenge to find evidence-based human rights education data because um, typically when it's done in schools, it's it's not like a separate course. It's harder to try to capture it. But in the non-formal education sector where you have courses devoted to human rights related topics, we do have more and more research available. So um, work that I did earlier on in the 1990s um, in relation to human rights education, when again, when it was really in its earlier stages, was to recognize that whatever human rights education we do, it's got to be supporting the international human rights movement and that there are different strategies we can see around the different program models for human rights education. For example, typically human rights education carried out in the schooling sector is around just introducing people generally to human rights, making the discourse familiar, the language of human rights, getting to know the basics of human rights. And it should be about through and for human rights, but typically in schools, it's more just awareness raising about human rights and a kind of a positive socialization towards human rights, valuable, um, but not all we want to see happening in human rights education. The second kind of program we find programming is the professional development model. This is where we have human rights education for police, prisoners, uh, uh, prisoners, police, um, uh, prison officials, um, uh, teachers, those who are duty bearers or can be seen as duty bearers. And therefore the human rights is coming in to their work uh, as a form of, of, of their accountability to human rights standards. So, um, so that's very different than sort of introducing human rights to like youth in schools it's really focused strategically on their carrying out their own work in ways that are consistent with, with human rights. I call it the accountability professional development model. The final model uh, or program area is what I call transformation activism model. This is the kind of human rights education that we all get really excited about because it's typically working with rights holders to around knowing what their human rights are so that they can become capacitated, motivated to claim their own rights or work in solidarity on the um, human rights efforts of other of others who are, um, you know, are vulnerable or who are discriminated against. So this is the transformation activism model. You can find this in schools in like Amnesty International clubs, by the way, but otherwise you find it in non-formal education, uh, often working with vulnerable groups. Um, so that's, those are three very different ways of thinking about how human rights education and training can contribute to the, you know, the, the international human rights movement. So now as we, as I'm wrapping up, I want to acknowledge that there are lots of critiques of the international human rights system. In, in my own trainings and teaching in human rights education, I think it's important to acknowledge these critiques. It's important to acknowledge the critiques because it's on people's minds anyway. And if we want to introduce the human rights values or standards as something viable for addressing problems in our society, for encouraging governments to do better, um, then we have to recognize that it's a system that has been critiqued and for very in, di in different ways. It doesn't mean we have to reject human rights because it's been critiqued, but to recognize that it's also a system that is has not always been you know, fulfilled according to its ideal. Um, it's also an evolving system and it's a system that's being worked on. So, but it's kind of like the best we have to work with. That's my kind of philosophy. The human rights system, it's not perfect by any means, but it is something we can use. It's a tool for us to use Sometimes it's a really better match than others in certain national or local contexts, but it's there for us to use if it works for us, right? Okay, so the critiques. You may have already read this slide while I was, <laughs> while I was talking. Historically specific to Europe in World War II, when it was the United Nations was founded and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the foundation of our treaty systems, it did not include in those discussions many countries that exist today. It was the 1940s. 
the decolonization, the independence movements happened, you know, 50s, 60s, and so forth. So we do have those member states now. We have many member states, of course, in the United Nations, including Global South and Global North. But in the early days of the United Nations, that wasn't the case. Um, so um, the United, the human rights frame inside of the United Nations is based on natural law and individualism. There have been some counter checks to that now because the human rights system has evolved. So there now is a recognition of group, group rights like indigenous rights. There's some discussion about whether the environment has a right, can be non-human, uh, non-humans possessing rights. That's tricky because, you know, ultimately rights should be able to be litigated and to go into a court of law. So there are you know, differences of opinion amongst human rights experts about whether or not moving away from human-centered rights is a good idea or not. Many think, who are especially legally oriented, that that would be a mistake. It would dilute the power of human rights to be used, for example, in regional and international courts of justice. So, um, but just to say in terms of the evolution of human rights, we do have group rights now and we do um, have ongoing discussions about evolving rights as our technologies evolve, as our cultures evolve. It's a very dynamic area. And inside of these conversations in the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, of course, very inclusive of, of all countries that are now members of the United Nations. Um, another pushback is that values, the argument is that values cannot be universal, that they're it's just simply impossible. There's still, that's still something that's a very needy conversation. Um, you know, there's an argument that there are co common values, for example, on equality. There's also recognition that many of the values that are human rights values are found across different cultures. Um, but a compromise, an easy sort of easy compromise is to, is to uh, kind of have a position of, of quasi universalism, meaning that the UN values like equality, participation, non-discrimination have, have potency across cultures, but that inside of individual cultures, we need to understand where are the footholds for those very values. So, so we don't want to dismiss the idea of common values or universal values, but recognize that they're not made up by the United Nations. They shouldn't be top down. They should be brought into conversation with local culture. And, you know, sometimes we're gonna see differences and that is where we have to have discussion. So it's not, but it's moving away from this top down, you know, this is, we figured it out at the United Nations and here are the values, no, 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 to have it much more discourse oriented and dialogical. And of course, we in education are very well positioned to address this, which I'll get to in a second. So not to um, jump too quickly into the remedies, if you will, for weaknesses of the international human rights system, we have more weaknesses, which is that it's not enforceable. It can be applied in a hegemonic manner. It's highly politicized. So if we think about our member states as human rights actors, we know that there are certain rights that our countries are more comfortable with because of our political histories, our, um, our political philosophies in the United States, a lot more comfort with civil and political rights than economic, social, and cultural rights. Well, that is changing. I have to say, we're even having language coming from our the executive branch on the right to health, the right to health care, the right to housing. So even though the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights is not signed and ratified in the US, we're finding that language very exciting. But nevertheless, we know, you know, some countries are you know, criticizing their enemies because of their human rights record, but they don't necessarily criticize their friends and allies on their human rights record. So it's, you know, these kind, it's basically becomes an instrument of foreign policy. And we know what happens when, you know, there are different, you know, political interests changing over time and depending on incidents. So these are critiques, but defenses of the international human rights system, as I mentioned earlier, is that it continues to evolve, which is very exciting. Quasi-universalism is also one way of dealing with this, you know, cultural relativism versus universalism kinds of tensions. And um, as I said earlier, I do believe that international law and UN mechanisms of protection are a unique contribution to world politics. There are different ways to try to work for social justice, especially in our own communities. 
but this is one of them, especially internationally and globally, that has a lot of um, a lot of staying power. Okay. So finally, I'm, um, as I as I wrap up, I just want to recognize that that the final trend, if you will, in human rights education um, has to do with our response to um, the critiques of human rights, which have become more um, more potent in recent years because of the assault on the human rights movement, to be honest with you. There's critiques have become more pronounced. But also, as I mentioned earlier, we used to have the legal literacy, the legal approach, and the popular approach. These have come together, and the combination is has become what we call critical human rights education or transformative human rights education to reemphasize that we need to carry out human rights education and training so that it makes a difference. If you're training as a lawyer and you want to go into human rights work, refugee rights work, you definitely need to learn the legal standards. But for the rest of us, primarily, we want to be learning about how it can be relevant to our interests, our avocations, our work, and so forth. So the legal literacy approach, by and large, in the popular model is rejected now. We're working now towards, again, transformative human rights education about through and for, and um, or critical human rights education, that's another phrase. So, um, so this has really been the response to um, the critiques of human rights, our own experiences in the field, where we've seen how important it is to have certain kinds of pedagogical approaches to human rights education so that we see this gold standard coming around and we see changes in our learners. Um, and so I am very optimistic as, by the way, about human rights education and its position to, um, to not only um, assist in the, you know, the global human rights movement, and that means it's not only the work of governments, but also others, it's a position to, to support that through the various programs that are being carried out, but to also um, to, to, to create environments where we can have really good discussions um, around what are human rights, what does it mean in our local environment, um, what are the critiques, how can we address these, you know, this, this kind of problem of universal values or um, the challenge for universal values and cultural relativism that comes up. So because we want discussions, because our pedagogy of human rights education is engaged with this kind of dialogical approach, not top down, I think it's intrinsically creating environments where we can, with our learners through, you know, through from in classrooms or training situations, um, move us um, into understanding and activating for, for human rights in whatever way makes sense for us personally in our in our environment. So I'm very optimistic about the position that HRE is in now because of our experiences of the last 30 years and the various trends that I mentioned to you. So thank you so much for your attention. Here again is my um, email address. Um, I'm wrapping up now, but I will be joining you live and I very much look forward to our conversation. Oke, okay. terima kasih Ibu Felisa untuk presentasi yang uh, luar biasa. Ini sangat komprehensif ya. Kita semua jadi bisa uh, belajar banyak tentang bagaimana uh, pendidikan HAM itu uh, dari A sampai Z, uh, terutama berkaitan dengan tren atau berbagai kecenderungan <laughs> untuk perkembangan pendidikan HAM di tingkat global. Uh, saya mungkin mencatat beberapa hal yang penting tadi disebutkan tentang bagaimana awal mula pendidikan HAM itu uh, tumbuh dan berkembang, mulai dari pendidikan populer yang uh, di, dikembangkan oleh uh, Freire, kemudian soal pedagogi kritis, teori pembebasan, berpusat pada siswa atau pesan belajar, tapi juga ada kritik terhadap pendidikan HAM yang terlalu fokus pada pendidikan literasi uh, hukum. Uh, kemudian juga Ibu uh, Felisa uh, menjelaskan mengenai apa namanya uh, tren yang ada di PBB ya. Jadi uh, mulai dari pendekatan berbasis HAM untuk kerja-kerja pembangunan, tapi juga ada ada banyak sekali terobosan-terobosan uh, apa uh, yang ada di PBB, termasuk deklarasi pendidikan ha, pendidikan dan pelatihan HAM. Kemudian ada dasawarsa pendidikan HAM dunia, kemudian ada juga program dunia untuk pendidikan HAM dengan berbagai fase itu. Uh, selain itu juga uh, Bu Felisa menyebut soal peran strategis pendidikan HAM di dalam gerakan 
uh, HAM secara global, mulai dari peran awareness raising, kemudian peran accountability, dan uh, peran uh, uh, apa namanya transformatif uh, activism model itu. Uh, hal yang menarik adalah mungkin bagian yang terakhir, yang uh, soal respon bagaimana membuat pendidikan HAM yang lebih transformatif, uh, bagaimana pendidikan HAM itu betul-betul memberi dampak perubahan, dan kita mencoba menolak pendekatan deklarasionis yang memang untuk diaplikasikan secara umum. Pengakuan terhadap pentingnya pedagogi kritis dan juga penggunaan model transformatif yang tidak hanya bertumpu pada peserta belajar, tapi juga mengadopsi apa namanya model praksis, mengubah pembelajaran, menjadi aksi. Itu beberapa catatan penting yang tadi uh, saya peroleh dari uh, dis, apa namanya pemaparan Ibu uh, Felisa. Ya. Sekali lagi kami mengucapkan terima kasih uh, kepada Ibu Felisa dan kepada kawan-kawan yang sudah hadir uh, di sini. Tetap semangat.